Hey everybody, uh, we're going to call to order uh, and roll call for the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board, uh, starting from the left over here. Tyler Gump, present. Hogan Hethington, present. Ken Kunzman, present. Mitch O'Bray, present. Mm -hmm. Kevin Fenderson, present. Kathy Wells, present. In, in the absence of Bill this evening, Tyler, you're going to be a voting member uh, this evening. Um, so that brings us down to item number two. Uh, visitors, comments, anyone wishing to address the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board must complete a, specker, a speaker's request form and return it to the administrative assistant. In accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board is restricted in discussing or taking action on items that are not posted on the agenda. Action on your statement can only be taken at a future meeting. In order to expedite the flow of business and to provide all visitors the opportunity to speak, the chairperson may impose a three minute limitation on any person addressing the board. And Mr. Serrano, I understand that you wanna speak at the number fifth uh, item down there, so we will uh, move to that um, here in here just a minute. Um, so that brings us down to three. Um, Parks and Recreation Advisory Board uh, reports on items of community interest. Um, in pursuit to the Texas Government Code Section 551.0415, the Park Board may report on the following items. One, expression of thanks, congratulations, or condolences. Two, information about holiday schedules. Three, recognition of individuals. Four, reminders about upcoming Park Board events. Number five, information about community events. And six, announcements involving intimate threat to public health and safety. Uh, brings us down to four. Um, like to approve the minutes of the regular meeting of the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board held on April 17th of 2023. Does anybody have any so, comment? Or? So moved. All right. With that being said, we will, you know, that motion, second. or I'm sorry, uh, anybody second that motion? I'll second it. All right. Thank you, Tyler. So that motion passes. Oh, what? Oh. All, all in favor, a long day. please say aye. 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 I kind of kind of got messed up right there for a second, so I apologize. Um, okay, so number five, we're going to receive an update on future CIP projects, Unity Park kickball concept plans, Marauder Park, and Coppers Branch Park. Good evening, board. Good How's evening. everyone doing? Yeah, right. Oh. All right, great. Have you been receiving my emails that I've been sending out with the updates? Mm -hmm. Is that a yes, yes for everyone? Yes. All right, good deal. So there's been no questions, so I'm going to assume that everything is good. Mm -hmm. And then I did want to remind you real quickly about June 10th, Celebrate Highland Village. I know we uh, we kind of we kind of spoke about that really quickly, but please can put that on your calendars. Uh, that'd be great to see you guys out there. All right, so future CIP projects for consideration. Um, you know, we've got another bond that Ken talked about coming up in possibly uh, 2027, 2028, right around there. So we wanna start having these discussions about what, what items can start going in there so that I can show the council that we've spoken about this, okay? And some of the, and some of the items are for review. We've talked about them previously, but we'll just go ahead and jump right in there. We're gonna start with Marauder Park Master Plan. This master plan was approved on June 26, 2012, resolution 2012-2356. And this is Marauder Park now. As you can see, I don't know if this pointer is going to work. Um, this is what it looks like now uh, when they when they built the neighborhood. That this was part of the uh, park fees that built this um, park right here. And we they did some work by adding a parking lot, and then adding a trail that came to a a, a circular um, roundabout there at the end. And then this there's a soft path trail that goes under the bridge and goes left, and this is part of Lake Louisville up there, okay? So this is this is what it looks like now, and we got a little close up right here. This is uh, Mr. Serrano's house, right? Okay, yep. right here. And he was involved in the process back in 2012 oh, cool. that got us to where we are today. And he's been in conversations with me for about the past four years about this and, and various staff. Um, so um, this is the concept plan. It's on the website, and I've got a close-up, but what you see here up here at the top are different elements, a sidewalk um, that runs through here. It's, it's talking about existing parking and an approach to it and some amenities like benches, and you've got a fishing pier here. We've got a fountain that uh, we, we've invested some money into um, and upgraded that with some lights here recently. In addition to that, we add an aerator in there to keep the pond healthy, keep the algae down. 
uh, in the in overall health of the of the pond, including the the fish that are in it. And then there's a, a landscape screen along here. And like I said, this is just a concept. Uh, elements can change in this, but the primary uh, objective is to hit the big things like the fishing pier, the sidewalk along here, the connectivity, some benches, and some type of a screening wall. Okay, so if we go back, you can see that none of that is there right now. Mm -hmm. there's, no, there's no sidewalk. Uh, there's no approach, no sidewalk here that connects with the uh, circle uh, drive right here. No amenities whatsoever, and there's not a fishing pier. Oops, I'm backing up too much. All right, here's a closer look at that. And so this was the master plan from... It's a concept plan. Concept plan from how long ago? Oh, and I put master plan. Well, no, it is a master plan. I'm sorry. It is. You are correct. From 2012. Is there any questions? Yeah, is, is, is that St. James Court built out or are there still vacant lots? I think it's built out now, isn't it, Mr. Serrano? Yeah, mm, yep. <clears throat> so all those, all those lots are, have, ha have homes on them now. Yes, sir. Does this park, um, I'm assuming it ends right there on the map, it doesn't go all the way to Louisville Lake right there under the bridge? The, if we go back, let's back up. One more slide, you can see the the turnaround right here, mm -hmm. it stops basically at core property. Okay. And right now, that property is not under our lease. Okay. As well as this, this is not under our lease. Great to know, thank you. Uh-huh. Any other questions? Okay. All right, so the cost for professional services is about 75,000 for landscape, to, and that's including uh, landscape design, engineering, and uh, construction documents. Uh, the construction estimate range is between 750 and $850,000. So the next step is to propose funding for a future bond, which could be in 2027, 2028, okay? Any questions? In terms of the bond, how much would that be covered, you know, in there? Would it be a complete, or is it like a matching, or, because I know some vary, but in the cost? We, we could apply for grant funding uh, for to partially offset this. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's yet to be determined, but as we move forward, you know, start talking about these future projects for the, um, for CIP planning. Okay, would this be a good time to invite Mr. Serrano up? Would you like to talk? Sure, I, I didn't know it was uh, all the way to the 27th. That's pretty far off. Yeah. yeah we've been kind of waiting for, for 10 years. So we, we've been waiting for... Come on uh, up here. Sorry. We've been uh, um, waiting for our, our uh, park and pond to come up to par to the other park that's uh, that's right there on 2499. So there's another pond, right? And that's that's been uh, you know built up and uh, you know and 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 looks really nice, you know, forever. And Marauder Park has just kind of been left out, and and I'm seeing all of these uh, other parks. Uh, with the ponds and, and even the big park, I forgot what it's called, uh, the ranch. Um, everything, you know, money being poured everywhere around and ours. We, it took six months in order to fix the, the actual, um, what is it called, the, the fountain. Yeah, the fountain was out for six months. And if I wouldn't have said anything, you know, it would have stayed there like that for a while. So um, I'm raising my concern. Um, I like the plan. I mean, yeah, I helped out with the plan a while back, but I was surprised that it didn't, it didn't move anywhere. And uh, and and I'm still, you know, and I'm still happy about it. But now I'm not happy that it's uh, it's going to go that far out. So that's that's my concern. Thank you. Right. So Phil, can you just fill us Thank in? Thank you, the Mr. Background? Serrano. Just fill us in on the background with the timing, then. As far as after 27, 28. Yes, that's uh, that's potentially the next bond that we can have. Okay, so it's tied to the bond. Okay. Yes, with that with that amount of money, it would have to be tied to the bond. 
Okay. Has there been discussions with city council of any other methods of acquiring funding to do that? I mean, and, and, and help me understand, if, if we've got a mass master plan and we've sold a concept that here's what we want to do here and we're going to use park fees money or, or was it park fee money that for each one of those there in that uh, development? That they could either pay the fees or offset it by adding um, a park or building portions of it out, and that's what they did here. Is that correct, Ed? Uh, Ken? It's I wasn't here at the time, so I can't. Yeah, and I'm just trying to understand to how how the plan come about and who put the plan together to say this is what we want to do with it. Was that the city or was that the? Uh, no, that was the city working with uh, with the neighborhood. Okay. It's a long time. Yes, it is. And so what I was asking is, are there other, has it been explored that there may be other methods to acquire the funding to bring some of that about instead of waiting until 2027, 28 for a bond and then wait for two or three more years beyond that for it to actually happen? Uh, no, there's been no discussion with council about that. Okay, or, okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so Copper's Branch, um, it was requested that I bring an update, and this is also a future CIP um, uh, uh, project. It was approved in 2021. Several of you were on the, um, on the board uh, during this process, so th this is not intended to, to go in depth uh, with, uh, with the master plan. I know Terry sent out a copy. Uh, you guys all should have received it, and then it's also on the website as well. So uh, I just threw some slides in here. This is one of the engagement uh, opportunities that we had that was very successful. It was Speak Up Highland Village. And those were, were folks that couldn't make a, a tr the standard meetings that we held out there. Uh, we had uh, a couple of meetings that were in person, including walking the site. And you can see the feedback uh, for the different elements that came across on, on Speak Up Highland Village. And, and like I said, these are folks that couldn't make an in-person meeting and they were allowed the opportunity to um, uh, provide their information via email. Uh, so Sand Beach, um, let's see, uh, lighted multipurpose fields, soccer fields, hike and nature trails, um, bring the fireworks back to Copper Branch, which we've already done, new restrooms, and then that, you know, those are the top, um, the green tier there, and then from there it, it goes down uh, based off of uh, request. So this is in the, this is in the master plan um, that, that you received, and if there's any questions about any, any particular elements within this, you're, you're welcome to contact me directly and talk about it or anything that pops up during this, uh, this time, I'd be more than happy to talk, to talk about it. So what it did is it looked at Copper's Branch and, and tried to determine areas um, that could be better utilized. And one of, the, one of the areas, one of the big change was moving the boat ramp to where it is currently over to I-35 so that you can have the parking underneath 35 and use that space under there. Uh, that was a huge move. Um, in addition to that, um, we have that flex space with a, an improved flex space with a, with a, a um, education building that we can, we can use for uh, kid venture that is out there or any other education programs that we want to do on the water. Mm. Okay. Um, it gave um, the opportunity to take that that existing space that is a uh, that is being utilized as a boat ramp now and use it more of a gathering space for passive recreation use and fishing and that's the point that is located right here in this area. Uh, and of course, the parking has changed, and one of the requests from during the process from park board and and also residents was moving the kiosk up um, into an area where if, because um, right now it doesn't make sense. What it was previously is you were allowed to park and then um, if you wanted to use other elements within the park, then you would pay. And right now there's no place to park. So um, this, um, 
this provides that opportunity of moving the kiosk so that we can get parking right back up by the flex field again. Kind of where it was prior? Where, it's gonna function the same. Okay. Basically, and then what uh, what the kiosk is going to capture is is folks using the boat ramp. Yep. So here's just a an up close uh, shot of it, a better a better picture. And one of the other elements was to was to tie in the existing area here that is currently not being utilized and providing a, a little bridge and doing some nature trails in there, sort of like what we have at Wichita Forest. And then the, the area, this little piece right here is, uh, is cut off, but it's, it, you add it to the, to the bottom of this. And, and what, the, what that is, is it, this is Highland Village Road right here, okay, where it says gateway entry. Mm -hmm. That's what that's representing. And those two ponds when you drive up and you see them on the right. And you can see that there's a, there's a boardwalk there that goes through that existing waterway area that is not there right now. So it'll improve that area as well. Uh, this flex space, I'm gonna go back to that. It's desperately needed. We, we have a lot of requests for, for practice areas, a tremendous amount. And what this doesn't show on this plan is utilization of I-35 and what's the, the space that is currently under I-35 with do, adding a skate park or a pump park, something like that, and adding um, possibly um, practice areas with synthetic turf if someone wanted to do uh, hitting practice or fielding or soccer or uh, things like that. And I think even Bill at one time had requested maybe some pickleball um, courts as, as well underneath there. And this is the, the, the area directly south of the gate entry, which is more is considered Doubletree Ranch area. This is the bridge at Doubletree that connects to um, the Louisville side mm -hmm. and goes to Garden Ridge. You just got your bearings there. Mm -hmm. All right, so it's improving this area with uh, uh, possibly some uh, uh, little fishing piers here, and then that boardwalk continues along the lake there. It's a nice little feature. And then there's other, there's other boardwalk opportunities in this green space as well, and possibly trails. So this was the uh, focus area priority list. Um, you can see the boat launch and the, and the different prices, uh, Sunset Point, park road trails and electrical infrastructure, gateway entries, lakeside lawn, civic extension, swim beach, natural area, paddle cove, flex space under the bridge, boardwalks, trailheads, paddle launch, shoreline trails, the preserve boardwalk connector. And four years ago, um, this was $18 million, okay? And professional services is to be determined, but they're typically between seven and 10% of that. So if it's 18 million, you're looking at 10, 10%, you know, close to a million dollars, a little bit, or actually 1.8, uh, yeah. Is that right, is my math right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So today is, uh, there's minor improvements, um, there's been, uh, there's gonna be some asphalt work done just to maintain the safety and integrity of, of people getting in and out of there. We're gonna be maintaining the site and then there's some boat ramp improvements that we, that we did. We worked with uh, some of the boaters that use um, that fishing, excuse me, that boat ramp um, so that in periods of high water, um, they're still able to use it. We, put some chevrons out there and encase them in concrete so it, it guides the trailer so that they don't fall off the, uh, the rail because when it's flooded, you can't see that, uh, not the rail, but the concrete curb, you can't see it. So we're concerned about that. So that took care of that. So that's, that's how we're maintaining it today. So the next steps, uh, proposed funding for a future bond, which could be 2027, 20, 28, same thing. And we, we talked about this um, several years ago and what we were gonna focus on was the boat launch, relocation, well, the top four items, basically. You remember that discussion, Ken? I did. Yeah, 
and Kevin. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so is there any questions? So you would not be asking for the full 18? Uh, no, not at this time. And, and there's also another funding opportunity. The thing with, um, with the core properties is uh, money that is generated on the core property stays on core property. So as the cabins come into play and if we generate enough money and we're able to still maintain everything that we can at Pilot Hill, Ken, Ken, uh, Ken remembers, he's shaking his head, but that seed money that starts funneling in over to uh, Copper's Branch and we can start making those improvements right away if, if, if the uh, revenues uh, are looking really, really good and we're able to maintain everything, we can start at least the design process and maybe uh, some, some of the other elements, uh, parking lot, maybe under I-35 and start that boat, boat ramp area improvement. And I would assume some of the priority items were also on um, where funds could come back into the city by performing that, such as the boat ramp being a huge traffic site and then people will come in and yes. have to purchase to be able to get into the park to use the boat ramp. Yes. Then... So the, the boat ramp, what it does, it, because it's a, it would be, I, I believe when we did the research, it would be the only deep water boat ramp on the lake. And Mitch, you would probably know this. The big one in the colony, too. Oh, there is. Okay, the then very I'm, large one at uh, the, in the colony. Uh, what is that park called in the colony? I can't remember off the top of my head, but it is very. Well, deep. we would be one of two. <laughs> well, it's still it. <laughs> having two, it's it's going to be packed. You know, regardless high yeah. high water, low water. Mm -hmm. You know, I always chose to go to that that ramp just because of that scenario because of safety too because you can yeah. see everything you know you can guide yourself down and yeah. everything like that so that's the goal is to get something that is more boater friendly um are we, oh, is there i'm sorry uh, is there going to be any plan to have like a little um what is it called breakwater kind of close there or no wake zone you know kind of thing because i think I, you have to have it on a on a yeah. boat ramp we have it over here on this side and we also have it at pilot knoll i think it's required yeah pilot knoll is like perfect little spot because there's yeah. it's kind of nestled back in there mm -hmm. and i know coppers because i've on the current ramp i've done that before and you have these i mean you can't control a jet ski these people out there and like mm. so um but you know something to help break that up a little bit because i mean i had a little ski boat and just trying to get through them there sometimes was a little difficult so you know i think having it over on that side is going to be a lot better because hopefully it, people going 100 miles an hour over there and in the design <laughs> right and in the in the design process things like that are going to be discussed yeah and um they're going to you know one, once we get an approved design uh it's more than likely going to be coming through park board okay uh, to make sure that i mean this is a big ticket item this is a big change mm -hmm. this is a game changer for for highland village there's a potential for revenue just off that boat ramp is unbelievable so the 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 thought behind this is is not only the boat ramp but the um where's my dot i'm moving too fast but this area right here this dock area is extremely important to boaters where they can launch put their boat um and and uh, what is that line there phil to the left this one yep that's a swim line okay that separates right the boaters from from this area but um it, basically what i'm getting at is we can we can have a, a relationship with an outfitter that wants to come in and possibly rent jet skis sailboats things like that we get requests for that now but we don't have the infrastructure so it's uh, it's a bit of a challenge and then they want to be on site and if if they are on site we want to provide them a space that is not in the view of the public and that space would be more than likely be under i-35 mm -hmm. where the it, and that's if if TxDOT will allow us to do that um so there there's some discussions that still have to be had about that uh, are discussed about that. So we would like to have a vendor out there to help us with any aquatics and the opportunities moving forward with uh, non-motorized kayaks, canoes, things like that that are popular. Mm -hmm. Kind of like the stand-up paddle boarding mm -hmm. over at yep. Palo So, Phil, it, the sequence in my mind 
I, if I have this right, was that we did the master plan for Copperas way before the paddle park kind of came about. And I'm wondering if there aren't elements of that paddle park, like kayak rentals, um, just kayak docking facilities, so that if folks start utilizing that, we create an opportunity and a reason for them to come to Highland Village, to Pilot Knoll. So is that something that we kind of need to integrate or kind of think about integration opportunities between that paddle park um, that was, I don't know, if, if we adopt I know that the Denton County Lake communities kind of cooperatively worked on that. Are there elements of that that we ought to be thinking about kind of adding into or integrating into the master plan? Yes, and we, we're already doing that at um, Pilot Knoll. I just uh, completed um, the boating access grant two weeks ago and submitted it. And what that does is it provides a, um, um, a kayak, ADA kayak and canoe launch, which is a non-motorized watercraft launch. And it, it, it makes improvements to the existing boat ramp that is there and removes boaters from docking on the existing dock that is there now and the existing dock becomes a uh, just a primary non-motorized watercraft launch with improvements and the existing boat ramp at Pilot Knoll is going to have its own dock and this is just coming from the boating community too. They want their own dock adjacent to the ramp because it's very inconvenient to run your boat over to the dock, come across the dock, come back to your truck, and then go park it. So I used to do that myself. <laughs> yeah, it, did, it didn't make sense. So hopefully your boat was still there. So <laughs> yeah, if, it didn't, if you didn't tie the knot right. So <laughs> and, and and you didn't leave the truck running. You know, like some people do. You know, just or leave the keys in the truck. But it, it makes it safer, and then it also provides an, uh, some ADA parking, and then future expansion of that parking lot to accommodate the larger trucks, larger trailers, and larger boats. Mm -hmm. Pilot Knoll um, averages anywhere from, from 2,500 to 3,000 plus visitors a month. And a large percentage of that um, is, uh, is boaters. Yeah. They, uh, they use that park frequently. So I, I get a lot of um, uh, recommendations uh, from the boating community over there. Yeah, it was a, one of the best spots to be because it was nestled back in there. Mm -hmm. You didn't have to worry about waves, stuff mm -hmm. like that. Yep. I always chose that. Mm -hmm. Did I answer your question, Kevin? You did, thank you. Okay, good deal. <clears throat> okay, so now I'm gonna bring up uh, Kirk uh, Wilson with uh, half an Associates who's been working on the kickball feasibility study. He's a uh, professional service on architect, landscape architect, and half an Associates is a very good company. I've worked with them in the past. They've been here for years, and uh, this is the same company. And Kirk was the, um, was the lead on it from half the, who designed Grayfield. Uh, it turned out to be a very successful project. That's Grayfield at Unity. Okay, Kirk, there's your. Yeah. You know how to use that. Yes, sir. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm Kirk Wilson with Half Associates. Uh, I'm not sure if it's required to get the address, but 4000 Fossil Creek Boulevard uh, in Fort Worth, Texas. And so what we're going to talk about today is the Unity Park kickball field uh, addition. Um, <clears throat> this is kind of our agenda, what we're going to talk about, the progress, and we'll open up and look at the concept review review the cost assessment, and if we have enough time, move on into the Q&A discussion. So moving on to the progress. Um, what we've done so far, you'll see the red check as being complete. Uh, we had our kickoff meeting with Phil and staff. We went to the, uh, to the site, reviewed it, took a look at the, the overall space. From there, we sat down and worked out a number of little concepts, reviewed those again with Phil's staff. Uh, and then tonight, or tonight, we're discussing with y'all, the park board. And then we're gonna have some discussions uh, later on with city council and then some other considerations for the bond. So this is just kind of the timeline of where it's all going and, and what we're trying to do as this moves on. Concept review. Now, one of the things we, we first wanna address is that we, when we came in and looked at the site, there was a discussion about it being open to softball and baseball. 
as we looked at the site, as we looked at the constraints, as far as kids' castle, um, the nearby road, foul balls became a very deep concern of ours of leaving a baseball field or a softball field. So we stepped back and said, okay, collectively, but we got to keep the public safe. And so we stepped back and said, okay, we're going to look at this from a kickball sense and then also possibly a Miracle League field. Uh, Miracle League, if anybody is, is unsure, is basically kind of a field of dreams for children with uh, disabilities. So it's a, it's a very popular uh, league that allows uh, children with disabilities to play baseball or softball, but they play with a much softer ball. They don't, they don't play with a very hard ball. So anyways, we looked at those kind of uh, uh, constraints and design possibilities. So with that, we looked at uh, the first concept, which was uh, kickball field concept A. Um, let's see if this will work. Oh, it's a little hard to read. Um, we looked at the design opportunities with this. Um, kind of looking at those bullet points, it, it activates that park space to the southwest corner, uh, provides a separated loading area <clears throat> here that kind of provides a separated area so when people offload or get out of here, they're not just all piled up uh, and allows for some stacking, some in and out, people to gather. <clears throat> Takes advantage of the overall north-south access to the field. Um, also, you know, we discussed removing this restroom and relocating it, so now this becomes centered <clears throat> between <clears throat> the field, Kids Castle, and the dog park. So now it kind of revolves around that, allows people of different use to get to that central location. Um, a minimal impact to the trail. Uh, it really, you know, try, you know, works with the grades and, and starts to minimize how much trail actually gets disturbed. And so you kind of, you know, that saves some money there. <clears throat> and then also it creates a, a large um, green space to the north with, for multi-use fields. Um, when you look at the design constraints, um, without having really shot and looked at the grades, just as a professional eye, we see that there's going to be some retaining walls uh, there to make it work to get the proper grades for the fields. And then just the orientation, the, the sun can kind of get into the eyes. Uh, it's not always going to be a problem, but it is just something that, 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 that people visiting a field like this will kind of complain about. It mainly, we looked at that, you're probably talking about uh, the first baseman uh, type situation. Uh, moving on, concept B, we moved the field up to the north, um, trying to um, really kind of uh, look at you know, put it in such a way that, that foul balls or things like that, it really just uses a lot of the, of the open space, kind of spreads it out, keeps the, um, the green space kind of spread out between Kids Castle and the field itself. Once again, activates the park in the northeast corner, um, provides a separate loading area for people to kind of get in and out, uses that existing parking lot. Um, once again, locates the restrooms. They're not quite as centered because of how tight the space is, but it does relocate it, puts a little bit closer, Kids Castle in the dog park. Um, once again, you, you still have some minimal impact to the trail, uh, but that trail doesn't necessarily have to be moved uh, for the field itself, more to open up for those, those multi-use fields, uh, which was part of the program that we were kind of tasked to look at. Um, larger areas for independent seating, um, as we know, you know, oops, excuse me. Um, as we know, there's a lot of bringing your own seating where people are just going to kind of spread out with blankets or whatever, or chairs, lawn chairs, fold up chairs just to kind of enjoy the space. Um, the design constraints, kickball field uses a large amount. This particular layout really kind of pinches everything down and really gives you one multi-use field uh, versus two. Um, and the, the other thing that really that kind of triggered us um, was the fact that this parking lot here gets really separated. So when you have people who are coming to the park, to the kid's castle, to the field, they're all going to try to pack in here. Uh, it's just human intuition to take the easiest path of resistance. So to us, that kind of creates that conflict of users who are all trying to do their own thing. 
Um, so that was a concern of us as far as constraint goes. And then the grades near home plate, the water is going to naturally try to drain this way. So we have to try to m manipulate this grade in order to keep water um, off a home plate and, and really should be draining downhill. So there's just some, there's some, a little bit of grading magic per se that we have to do to make that work. Concept C, um, this is where we really kind of try to use every bit of ground that we could to cover all of the program items, multi-use fields, the softball, the restroom facility, the parking lot gets spread out. Um, so here, once again, it activates the southeast corner, uh, provides a location uh, where younger children can play while the parents are playing or, or, or older siblings uh, are playing on the softball field or the kickball field. Um, once again, it brings those restrooms closer in. Uh, we could probably bring them in a little closer, but we have some utilities in there that we're just trying to figure out. And without a survey, we don't know what those full extent are. So that's about as comfortable as we could bring it, but that still centers it between the multi-use fields, um, the kickball field, the playground, the dog park. And then also it distributes the parking around. So now if, you know, if this is really busy, um, parents, guardians have the opportunity to come over here and park and bring their, their children uh, to Kids Castle or to the dog park. So it starts to spread out that parking area. Uh, design constraints, it is a, it is a rather um, large impact to the trail system. Uh, we're not totally sure what that alignment, how it all works out. Uh, but it does impact it. And then also, as far as what we can tell, there's probably gonna be a little bit more series of retaining walls, again, to get that grade to work out. Um, with that, there's, um, we're gonna, we'll step now into the estimate aspect of it. Now, go ahead. Yeah, let me, let me speak before we move on, before you move on to the estimate. The, the one of the, non-negotiables is the movement of the restroom. We get a lot of requests from Kids Castle, mommies, grandparents, uh, dog park people. Um, they, the, the, where the restroom is located is so far away from, from the programmed areas. Um, so that, that has to be moved. The other, the other need that we have is, is the new parking area that is to the north. There is a lot of um, folks that, uh, who have children in Briar Hill Elementary that use that parking lot. And we really wanna not only provide a space for them, but also those that would be using the practice fields, the, the grass practice fields um, that are uh, identified as multi-use fields, give them their own parking space so that they're not competing with um, the kickball folks or the dog park folks are the ones at Kids Castle. Um, so it's, it's, it's definitely needed. The other thing is also activating the lower pond um, and adding a dock. You, you saw in all of those concepts uh, to add a, uh, a, a dock there that is close to Kids Castle. Yeah. So, if you have if you have kids at uh, parents with kids at, at different ages, you know, 13 down to like like us, you know, we got, you know, there's there's 12 years of separation between the oldest and the youngest. So when you go to places like this, there's things for the older kids to do, and also for the younger kids as well. So we we you know, uh, Hafen Associates has been really thoughtful and considerate about how they can utilize the space not only for uh, the kickball, and uh, but also for for um, families that would have uh, uh, children at different ages. The the other thing that wasn't spoken about is that this this field would also um, help satisfy the adult uh, sports need that that we we are challenged with here. We have a lot of youth sports um, and do a really, really good job in that space. This provides adult programming for kickball in addition to that, and he's gonna go into the numbers, but we would we would prefer that this be synthetic turf because of the usage. And we would he would put lines of a mini soccer field out in that uh, kickball field that can be used also for flag football. So we would have, th this field would be utilized for three sports. 
uh, for adult programming for sure. Okay. Thank Bill, you. Real quick question, just to be clear then, this is the field that's currently LASD no. football practice field? No. No, the field that is LISD is uh, further to the south. It's on, if you look at this behind you, I'll point to it. Yep, it's right here in this area. Okay. Got it. Thank you. You have a rough idea how many people play kickball or sign up? Just oh. rough estimate, I guess. <sighs> We have, I think, anywhere from eight to 14 teams, depending on the season, that's played twice a year. And we're the, I believe, the only adult, one of two adult kickball programs that is successful and still around in, in this area. Um, they really like the experience. In addition to that, what this does, and I'll speak a little bit about it, because we have staff that plays, we have staff that, um, has either to play on our team or they or they um, make their own team. But there's the secondary activity that happens after the game, where they where they wind up down at the shops and uh, you know at Shoal Creek or or one of those venues, and that that's just uh, you know tw uh, once to twice a week. So that's positive activity and positive revenue flow. That's that that comes into the city in two ways. Do you want questions now, or do you want to wait until the end of the presentation? Uh, why don't we wait till the end of the presentation, okay. unless it's something that I directly spoke of, of the restrooms and the additional. I just didn't want to question bomb you before you were ready. Okay. <laughs> and, and then if I may ask a question on, if you went with this concept or any of the concepts, do trees come into play, existing trees? shade structure, canopies, and how it might impact some of the root systems and those trees that are there. Yes. So to answer your question concerning those trees, yeah, we, we did try to look at, no, we didn't, we didn't try. We did look at the existing, existing aerial data and try to see what trees are being impacted. Uh, we're going to try to minimize that as best as we can. Uh, there's a lot of things that you can do uh, to support the trees that do remain, um, such as uh, root pruning, mm -hmm. things like that, uh, you know, canopy clearing, uh, ground aeration. So there is that, there is that opportunity uh, to use a lot of the trees and to protect the trees, um, as well as improve their, you know, their chances of survival after construction. It's, uh, it is a, a force of nature that trees do get disturbed by that. Uh, but we do really take that in consideration when we're, when we're working at that and working on those efforts. Um, if you see in the lower corner where the trees are, um, we are looking at incorporating some uh, picnic shelters as well as some bench areas so that we can t take advantage of some of that existing shading. But yes, we are going to try to work as much as possible to preserve the trees that we can. So. Uh, as we and if we go forward, mm -hmm. I would appreciate it if you would include how you've addressed that, okay. what the anticipated loss might be, uh, and just, yeah, I sure. think that would be helpful. Okay. Do you, do you, do you I've got a lot, so I'll <laughs> got to. <laughs> I appreciate that. I like, uh, I like when people ask questions versus kind of stoically accepting it all <laughs> or quietly <laughs> killing me in their minds. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're, we're a very inquisitive uh, board. That's all right. Uh, now, we're gonna, now we're gonna step into the cost estimate. Now, what you're gonna see here is we try to break this down into very simple terms because there's our simple line items. There's a lot going on. Um, with these types of fields. And so we've, we've endeavored to really put some solid numbers to this. We've made some phone calls. We've also, because of the nature of the market increases, trends in construction, um, we put in a 30% construction contingency that really drives the number up. The majority of the time, most people at this stage, may put somewhere between 15 and 20% contingency, but as we have numbers coming in from bids on various parks around Texas and even in Oklahoma and Arkansas, we're, we're starting to see a 30% trend uh, to cover a lot of that. So um, 
It's just, it seems to be the, the nature of the beast right now. Uh, like I tell a lot of our clients, we don't know what the silver bullet is. We don't know what, what triggers one group to go way up high and another tr group not. It's just, it's something just gets a hold of them. And, uh, and we're trying to, you know, make sure our numbers reflect that those trends are moving all over the place. So at the end of the day, uh, site preparation, site improvement. So site preparation would be the removal of the site, removing demolition, just getting it ready, maybe bringing in utilities, just depending on what all we have going on in there. Uh, site improvements, which would be everything outside of the field itself. Uh, which would be site grading, um, paving, parking lots, things like that, walks, retaining walls. And then finally we go into the item number three, which is a synthetic turf field with amenities, amenities being backstops, dugouts, um, bleachers. And then we have electrical and lighting, that's primarily for the field. Um, the 30 space parking lot, uh, the restroom facilities, and then finally to kind of put the icing on the cake, the landscape planting and irrigation uh, to bring all that around. Um, our opinion of probable uh, construction costs ranges between 1.1 to 1.8. Um, and then by the time you throw in the soft costs, which is our efforts uh, or another firm that you choose to bring in uh, to, do the, to do the design and construction documents and other support services, uh, we're probably talking about a grand total of 1.2 to 1.9 uh, million dollars. Now, that's of May 23 this month, so these numbers could change in a number of ways. Um, when we spoke to the synthetic turf uh, people, they said basically right now, if they just, if you just did the field alone, you're probably about $900,000 and you leave the rest of it off. So that becomes kind of like your base bid. Everything else is all alternate, you know, that you can, that gets you what you want at the end of the day. Um, so when we step back and look at it with our eye as professionals, as time and things, you know, we use our own judgment and efforts, it may be closer to 1.5 million. But the reason why we went with the 1.9 is because we just don't really know what's truly out there. There's all kinds of unknown conditions. On top of that, because it's gonna be kickball, we may not have to go as deep into the field prep as you would a normal baseball, softball field. So there's all kinds of little variables that, that get worked out in the design. So that's what we tried to give you at the end of the day was this kind of, you know, the low ball to the, to the you know, low range to the high range type effort to help you make that judgment. So, um, I'm hoping that makes sense. We wanna make sure that you're, you're given the, the options to really look at it and truly understand it. Um, as we go into the, is there any questions? I said, I'm gonna go ahead and move into the Q&A, but I'll back up so you can leave that up there. Um, open to questions and hear what y'all have to say. Let me grab my pad of paper first. <laughs> And also, uh, as a caveat to that, if y'all come up with, if you're kind of like me, sometimes I don't come up with questions until about three o'clock in the morning. Uh, <laughs> so I wake up in bed, go, oh my gosh, there's a question. Uh, please uh, reach out, let me know. Um, we'll try to get you as best as possible. I do have one question. Um, just the flexibility of the field itself. Mm -hmm. um, what are the chances now? I don't know the rules of uh, kickball, you know, down to a tee, um, but in terms of that being a flexible area for our residents to practice baseball, is that a possibility? I don't know if there's a fence behind there. I wouldn't suspect there to be a fence, but the flexibility for, <clears throat> because we can't use unity <clears throat> in terms of practicing, so would that be another option to be able to practice on baseball? I mean, you probably have to make it an age limit, but depending on, because you start talking about the road and foul balls and stuff like that, but I'm just curious. From this standpoint, as far as this design would go, is probably no at this point. Okay. Uh, it, it is, there is a serious concern with balls leaving that field without the proper safety equipment put in place. 
I would hate to see something happen or somebody got hurt. Yeah. You know, and it's just, it's, you know, it can get rough. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we talked about this extensively. And, and when Kirk says proper safety equipment, it, it means the height, the vertical height of that equipment of a foul ball. If it, you know, you're, you're looking at 30, 40, 50 foot type netting that you would see at Top Golf. Mm -hmm. uh, that type of structure uh, to ensure the safety, especially with the proximity that it has um, to Kids Castle. That, that's a very, very big concern. Um, and, and then the other thing is, is, is just remember that we have, we have five youth sports fields up there b uh, between baseball and softball. Okay. And right now we don't really, we don't have anything that I can put my finger on that's for adult outdoor sports programs, mm -hmm. which is kickball, soccer, and flag football uh, is what we're getting for requests. Okay. Thank you. So you were through with yours, correct? <laughs> yeah, no, go ahead. The um, number of teams, you said 14 or so approximate teams, that's from this general area, not just Highland Village. What percent of those are residents of Highland Village, in your opinion? Oh, your, I, would, I would say close to 50. And that's a bunch. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, similar to baseball and softball. We run, a, you know, or it's just under 50 percent, and and most of it is adults. In oh yeah, okay. yeah. Every, everyone like, you know, 18 and older. May, may, there might be 16 and some 16 year olds in there that right. are coming and, and wanting to play, but they're yeah, they are primarily adults, and they they, if you've never been to a kickball game, you should go. They typically um, there's kids in tow, mm -hmm. you know, and strollers and mm -hmm. things like that. So the utilization of Kids Castle. Uh, would just be a bonus, especially keeping it there close to it. And then on the the back side, is there there fencing in this kickball? Mm -hmm. Yes, it would be. And there's a home run if you kick it over a fence on the back side, or is it an open back? Or side? can they kick it over the back? Uh, they they can, but you're talking about a softball. It's not a it's not a soccer ball. No, yeah. it's a rubber ball, right? Yeah, it's yeah. a it's a it's a rubber ball, but you know, I'm just I really I they have done it over the fence. Is there a fence on the back? Yes, yeah. there is. There's a fence completely around it. Okay, okay. so then that that stops some of the open area. Mm -hmm. It's it prevents the ball from going out in the open area. Yes. Okay. I the multi-use field. Though. Yeah. Well, with the, yeah, some yeah. of the concepts, they're bleeding into the the multi-use. Right, they're fields. right up against yeah. it. So the, it's just showing the footprint of I get it. of of what can be put out there. But you're going to have a, a more than likely a concrete curb uh, with a synthetic field. You got to have you got to have that. And then you got to have you know we're we're at least going to have a six foot fence all the way around it. The 14 teams. Where do they play now? They play between Grayfield and Redfield right now at Unity. And softball and baseball would love to have their fields back. Mm -hmm. That's what I was wondering. What, yes. What's the current problem? <laughs> they, they, were, they were in the conversations. They were, they were one, of the, one of the groups that we brought in early on. Okay. And then this would also be, it could be used as a miracle field like Correct. Kirk was uh, talking about. And, and then we have uh, mentioned in the, the funding was lighting. Um, and with it being adults, a lot of play, does it currently occur at night or in the evenings? In the evenings, after, after work. So now you <clears throat> would be moving the potential for lighting up closer to Briar Hill Boulevard, right? Or yes. Briar Hill Road. Mm -hmm. Do you expect that there are concerns by the residents there? No, because what they, I'm oh, sorry, did you finish? Yeah, uh, for that. Uh, no, the, the, the lighting design and technology has come a long way, and the fact that the lighting can be um, LED lighting and it's direct lighting. It, it doesn't have the bleed over into the residents like your traditional lights that are there now that, that bleed over into the areas. So it's more direct. And Kurt, you can probably talk a little bit more well, about and this. And I can talk about it too because my house backs up to the double tree. And I've heard that about the ambient lighting and, and, da, 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 it, it, and, and I'm not saying that is wrong. It still does light up from quite a distance mm -hmm. away. So and I just wonder if you feel like there would be any concerns from the residents about that 
because I think you might get quite a bit of concern if you tell them you're going to put lighting out there. Yeah, what I really, what I need to do, because Doubletree does not have the new technology and lighting. What I need well, to do. Well, it did when the concept was put forth. It was the new technology oh, it was. at the time. Okay. Okay. So yeah. this is at the time as well. And all I was saying is you won't be able to see this yet. You were, you had shadows along the house from the ambient lighting that wasn't even supposed to be over in that general area. And you know where my house is. Right. It's plumb on the other side of the fields. Mm -hmm. So that would be a concern that I think those residents in that area might have. Sure. And we would, you know, we, we would have meetings just, just like we did with Copperas and just like they did with Marauder Park. Um, this is a concept, it's not a master plan. And once we start heading in that direction, it looks like it's gonna be funded because this is not guaranteed that it's gonna right. make it. Um, but the, the lighting technology has changed dramatically and, and, and I really need to bring pictures mm -hmm. um, of what that looks like, especially, uh, Kurt, you can, you can talk about this, but uh, the bleed over is, is I, I mean, I, it's I almost a wall kind of uh, yeah, it's almost a wall. Exactly. That's a good way to describe it. You, mm -hmm. you have to be on the field to play in order to be in the light spectrum. Mm -hmm. Outside of it, it's dark if there's no other lighting. They've gotten that good with it. And Hogan. Yeah. <laughs> um, waited patiently. <laughs> okay. So um, just, I guess, the first question. Uh, so I know you were talking about having turf for the field instead of grass for maintenance purposes. Um, I'm guessing is, I guess, what's the difference between the upfront costs of having turf? I'm assuming turf is more expensive up front, but it's cheaper down the road because you're not maintaining it like you would regular grass. But with the experience of our current baseball softball fields that are being maintained and how similar the kickball course or uh, field would be, uh, do those costs kind of meet out where turf is really the option we should go with? A great question. So when when you look at it in terms of athletic fields, the first thing you look at is utilization mm -hmm. and the specific sport. So at baseball and softball, you have a one sport utilization, mm -hmm. in which the outfield, you have three outfielders and then everyone else is on the infield. So there is a very minimum uh, amount of uh, what we call divot activity okay. in the outfield for baseball and softball. When you look at kickball, similar, you got outfielders, but then you, you overlay and basically the same type of uh, uh, utilization and wear and divot factor, but you, you overlay soccer on that with goal mouse and you overlay flag football on that, then you have a concentrated amount of wear and tear in a very specific area, unlike baseball and softball. So your wear would be significantly more okay. uh, for the three sport utilization. Okay. All right, that was just something I was isn't, wondering. Isn't that what happens at Doubletree though? You know, in terms of the soccer playing, mm -hmm. flag football, it's just soccer. Just soccer? Mm hmm Okay. Yep. And it's the little kids. Although we yeah. we we started doing, I believe, I think it's U twelve now out there. I'm just really big on real grass. <laughs> I am too. That's my well, big thing. and you real know my grass. background. You but know. where it makes not only that, it's just I just like the aesthetic of it. You yeah. Know? I just think it looks better, cleaner. Right. You know, you can just mow it you know, type thing, but yeah. It wouldn't require that retaining wall to box in the turf, that concrete on, on that side? Yeah, the concrete mow strip, we, we, yeah. we want to put that in everywhere we go, regardless of it's uh, grass or synthetic turf. Yeah. But, you know, back, Mitch, back to your point, you know, you know I'm a master certified professional yeah, turf no, grass no, manager, no, I and I love grass. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, I have to look at utilization, then I have to look at the maintenance dollars that would be yep. associated with that. And what I don't want to do is put something forward that we're going to struggle to keep up with uh, maintenance-wise. And, and a good example of that is the dog park. Yeah, It's a very small dog park. Yeah. And the maintenance on that is the same maintenance practices that we do on athletic fields, and that's why it looks so good. Mm -hmm. yep. But in the high traffic areas at the top where we, we just kept resodding, you know, once, twice a year, we had to come up with a different plan because we were getting too many complaints, mud, uh, depressed uh, issues in, in, the, in the surfacing. 
and, um, and just safety issues. So that's why we put the synthetic turf only in that one spot and it seems to be working really, really well. So yeah, I'm with you. Anywhere that I can put natural gra grass, that, that is the goal. Yeah, th there is definitely a time and place. And what's the warranty on that approximately? Um, is it like it's 14 years? No, it's, it's higher than that. It's it about 20 years to 25 okay. Okay. under normal conditions. Yes. And is it easy to patch repair? Yes, turf? this system is, and that's why we yeah. we stay with Forever Lawn because of their um, their warranty, nice. their maintenance are local. They're here in Richardson. Uh, they're a national brand, a national company. That's good. They put in uh, collegiate fields, high school fields. I mean, that, that this is their lane, and they've been very successful in that space. Awesome. Would this field with the fence going all the way around it, would it be something that is generally locked up or is it something that's just gonna be kind of open to the public and then has its rentable space opportunities for things like kickball and the other utilities? We're gonna manage the usage, so yes, it okay. will be locked up. Okay, and that also will help with the upkeep of the right. field as well, making and sure that. It's the same thing that we're, that we're doing with baseball and softball right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, next question I had was, um, does the kickball league have any kind of revenue for the city? Is there any kind of sign-up fee for teams or any kind of um, they there know, is. Pay for utilities or using fields? No, there is, okay. and it's just a, um, it's a just, it washes out. Okay, so it's a, it really this would be on the city just as a new service for people to use. There's not any that kind of offer. expectation of revenue out of this. Like tennis okay. and uh, mm -hmm. baseball. Yeah, this softball. isn't the first one. I just mm -hmm. wanted Other to make sure. The point that I think Phil made that what they do after a game mm -hmm around the shops right. and other businesses. Uh, it, it, keeps, right. it keeps them here, it keeps them in the community, which is fantastic. Yeah, the, the revenue that we that we bring in from registration fees and like that, they, it just offsets the maintenance uh, like tennis does. You know, when we got to resurface a, a tennis court, you mm -hmm. know, it, it runs several thousand dollars, yeah. netting, uh, pickleball, okay. you know, things like that. Awesome. We already talked about that one. Uh, so the new parking over there on the north side of the park, uh, is that right up against the railroad tracks or is that like the normal like 20 feet off because you have to have that space away from the train? It's, it's relatively close to the railroad tracks. Okay. We would have to talk with the railroad company just to be neighborly, just to mm -hmm. get their thoughts. You're also really <clears throat> relatively close to some of um, upper Trinity's mm -hmm. um, areas as well. So there would be some coordination there to okay. get that all squared away and, and get it, uh, get their blessings per se. Um, <clears throat> you know, we would probably need to start that process pretty quickly okay. as far as just reaching out to them and just letting them know mm -hmm. what you're doing. Uh, but majority of times I think within um, if you put up certain safety measures to keep people from wandering, most of the time the railroad company will, yeah. or, will try to work with you. Which is something I was wanting to bring up too, is with this being a huge young kids park, mm -hmm. being so close to the railroad tracks. I know the trains don't go through there often, but you know, you're now parked right next to them. Mom takes your kid out of the car, reaches in for the baby who's in the mm -hmm. uh, seat, come back, kids running across the railroad tracks. <laughs> So just something I wanted to Correct. bring up. Yep. So it seems like it's already gonna be covered, which is awesome. Um, and then the second question on that one is, why is it not just a little bit bigger? It can be, it, we, it, it certainly can be, but we, you know, we, we, he did increase the parking lot size there and it can be extended a little bit further mm -hmm. if we wanted to. But like I said, that, you know, this is just a concept. Those, those elements, when, if, if the project gets approved, um, and we typically stay with the with the concept company mm -hmm. uh, for the design piece of it because it just makes sense. They're vested. Is we start having discussions about okay, what does the budget look like? Yeah. What is what is the amount of bond? And uh, because at the, at the end of the day, Ken knows this, <coughs> we have X amount of dollars, and what is it that we can do mm -hmm. that makes sense that that meets all of the critical things? You know, whether it's uh, it's Marauder Park and yeah. making sure that that's done to its its fullest capability, and maybe the parking lot goes away because we got a fun Marauder Park and all of that that is there, you know. But one of the things that won't go away is the movement of the restroom and the orientation of that field. 
and where it needs to be. Nice. And then the, some, the, the pier doesn't have to be built. Mm -hmm. That can be a phase two, a parking lot phase three. Perfect. So we just start uh, value engineering uh, these things. And we, we work on that. And, and I'd, I'd say for those of you that, that didn't go through that, talk to Kevin and, and Ken, and they'll, they'll talk to you about that process and how we prioritize things as a, as a board. You guys are very, very active and involved in that, in that uh, CIP. Uh, plan moving forward to council. Awesome. Okay, I'll try not to get too into the weeds on that kind of stuff then. No, it's okay. <laughs> it's 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 all good. I mean, at the, at, at the end of the day, these questions are going to come out again yeah. later on as we get there. But if you have questions now, it helps him mm -hmm. um, uh, with planning, and he'll take this and put these notes in a file until it's it's launched. It's just you're you're already going to be pouring concrete for your sidewalks. You're already going to be pouring the concrete for the uh, parking lot if it's only. A few thousand, like a few uh, tens of thousands of dollars more to extend it and get another ten spots out of it. I know how used that park yeah. is, especially on the high peak days. You can't ever find a parking spot. Right. You're going to have to park the elementary school walk across the tracks. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. It it definitely is our most used park in the system, which is wonderful. I love that. Yep. And it, it, we're trying to to continue that excellence in, in programming. Mm -hmm. This is just one other element that provides that opportunity um, for, the, for the community to use. I've got other questions, but I don't want to be a question hog. <laughs> was, was the lighting in the budget, your numbers on that slide? Yes. 170, I think. 170. Yeah, the electrical item number four, electrical lighting, 170. Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, with the LED systems, getting back to that, there is the, the LEDs where you can uh, program the, uh, the K value as far as your brightness, the warmth. Mm -hmm. um, you can also work with the optics so the lights are much more directed uh, because they're, they all work off of kind of an um, electrical signal. I mean, like electronics. <laughs> so they're not just flooding. You can kind of manipulate that as need be. Uh, so next one I had was, um, I know you don't know yet, and this might not even be a good question to ask, but do you have any idea of the kind of trees that you guys are going to be planting yes. as the new trees? <laughs> yeah, we, we, we went through this through, and Kevin can probably speak about this too, but with, as, a, as a friend of Highland Village Park, Park Foundation member, but specific trees, you know, there's, there's bur oaks, there's sawtooth oaks, there's Chinese pistache. Um, those three are, are very hardy trees, very low maintenance, uh, minimal trimming, and uh, they are showy, have great color. And there's a few other in the spectrum, but those three are, are typically the ones that, that we plant. And in this plan, and he didn't talk about it, whoops, I went too fast, went, or went the wrong way. There's gonna be a reforestation. You know, we know all those Bradford pears, and if, if the Friends of Island Village Park Foundation doesn't do it, it'll be picked up in this project. That was my next question. Is, are those Bradford pears going to be removed and replaced? <laughs> they're they're dying on their own. Yes, okay. and and we have a we have a, a very deliberate plan with the foundation to to go back after they're done, uh, to go back with trees after they're done at uh, Double Tree. Mm -hmm. Perfect. That's great. That's that was exactly my next point. Um, so the one after that is uh, on some of the different concepts, if you, know, you don't mind Phil or uh, going back to between C and B, I noticed, and this is just a concept picture, I noticed that the deck uh, on the dock had a different mm -hmm. shape. Mm -hmm. Here it's like a semicircle, and there it's more of extended with a rectangle. I know that's just a concept, but yeah. I just want to know, was there an enge engineering reason for this? or No, okay. just really an artistic just play on something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, I, I'll move past it. Them. You know, you know, with with concept C, you get a little bit more of a gathering area. It's just a larger yeah. footprint. You okay. know, uh, maybe that's a gathering space, or maybe it's, it's a, a a larger footprint for for parties or for reunions or whatever people want to do. Yeah. Um, where on concept B, it's much more of a of a uh, utilitarian, I guess one would say, just for fishing. Kind of limits what all you've got going on. So it's just kind of a. Uh, a different thought, different way. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Uh, I guess the next one I had was, is there currently existing irrigation for the trees that are the Bradfords that'll be replaced? So most likely we'll just build off of what's there. We won't have to put new stuff in. 
Uh, there'll be some adjustments, but they're minor. Okay, that's great, yeah. that's good. Uh, and then for concept B, I know we have that open area seating behind the, dug, uh, the bleachers and dugouts. Is that gonna be flat land, or is that gonna be more of kind of a raised hill down into the sidewalk? It's, it'll be flat. Okay. Yeah, and then, you know, we'll play with that and see as, as far as if budget, if it's gonna be all completely paved, or if it's a, if it's a, uh, an extension of, of turf or mm -hmm. all kinds of options, but our, our primarily in our mind is it's going to be paved okay. so people can gather. And that uh, whole gray area there would be the new concrete? Correct. Okay. And what this, this concept is it, it, it eats it into the available open space mm -hmm. and, and we wanted to show it, I almost didn't put it in there, but it's it's the least desirable one, at least from a staff standpoint and from an architect standpoint. Uh, this is probably the most desirable uh, from our vantage point. Oops. And the, the second would be uh, concept, uh, concept A. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, or you know, concept A, you can kind of squish and pull and move some things down. Same thing with concept C. Yeah. Concept B was really, that seemed like to be the sweet spot to put a kickball field, but it really is. It doesn't work with the park. It's forcing itself in there. I mean, it's driving. Everything else is having to right. a ripple effect to adjust. <clears throat> Including the parking, which right. is, there's going to be a lot of unhappy people with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, so if you want that kickball field and all its, its glory, that's, that's really probably the sweet spot, mm -hmm. but it doesn't really address your community's needs. Right. Does it really work with the park? Right. But it is something that um, you know you're 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 obligated to kind of review and for me to give you. <laughs> I appreciate I appreciate you coming with multiple concepts. Sometimes it's just one and you have to kind of pick it apart. But yeah. coming with three different options is is great and I appreciate that. Um, so uh, drainage for like this concept here, I'm assuming you guys are going to go for the path of least resistance down to the pond. Um, consideration for the trees that are currently there that get that from the field that just mm -hmm. comes to the pond. Um, just something I want to bring up. I don't want it to end up being a pipe coming from the field down to the pond that's keeping all the grass and all those trees. Well, there's not much grass under them trees, but the trees fed with water. Uh, I just want that to be something that we note. Um, and then I just want to reiterate on your point for the trees that we have there, um, we got to protect those big old trees as mm -hmm. much as possible, no matter what concept we do, even if that means shifting it by 20 feet one direction or the other. Bradford pears, I don't care about. But the, <laughs> the old ones we've got there, they've been there for forever. If we lose those, it's much more of a hit to the park. Uh, and then Phil, I guess this is a question for you, but I'm assuming with what we've been seeing tonight with these CIP projects, this is something that's gonna be on that 2027 bond. It's for consideration, yes. Generation. Yep, so we'll, we'll have a workshop like we did for the 2022. We'll okay. sit down and, and, and we'll revisit all of these. Okay, awesome. Is there any talk about a, because we were at the movie in the park last week. Yeah, thank you. Oh, um, any spot for a food still. truck? Parking? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. On this site? I didn't quite see it unless there is. But there is one right now with a 50 amp uh, breaker that's existing. It's right across the street from the pavilion. It's right here. Okay. Because I thought that was a that was popping last last week. All the people going mm -hmm. to you know all the food trucks and it was a beautiful day. Yeah. You know, a beautiful night to do that mm -hmm. and you know. I went over there myself and got a handful of things too. And that's like being a concept, we can definitely add, um, and Kirk will make a note of this, but a food truck slip up here in the parking lot. Yeah, uh, something to close make it, there too. Yeah, closer, yeah. just gotcha. probably one, 50 amp, maybe two at the most, as that parking up there is a prime and it will be utilized with, when kickball, um, mm -hmm. if, if we were to go with this concept, or go with this project rather. Okay, is there any other questions? I'm good, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Yes, sir. Thank you. We appreciate, appreciate you coming. You yes, did a great job. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions on yes, that? I do. Oh. Not, not on this. Um, back at. at no. We'll talk some more. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Back at Marauder. Mm -hmm. um, I just find it a little troubling any time that, that we say, here's what we plan to do and here's what we look to do, 
and then things get in the way that prevent us from actually bringing that about in a timely fashion. And so considering doing this with the bond, how that works is four years from now, you get the bond money, you put it on, or you put it on uh, uh, a ballot, it's approved, time goes by, okay, now we've got the funds, now we've got to work, and you just, it, it's moving it so much farther down. Um, 4B funds are to be used for soccer and for trails. Correct. Not, okay. There are trails that run in Marauder. Correct. Correct. So potentially there's ways to utilize 4B funds to do some things at Marauder that have been promised for over 10 years. Possibly. Okay. And that would be something that I would think you could look at, yes. consider, and maybe it doesn't do everything, but it makes some progress. Yes. And I don't know how much funds are there. I know the bottom uh, funds that are just sitting is now finally continuing to grow, but I haven't looked at it in a while. And I know Ken can, can speak to it, but I would think that's something that we could look at to bring some changes about a little quicker than waiting just for a bond approval and five, six years, seven years down the road. Mm -hmm. Yes. We could also uh, look at funding the design at okay. $75,000, which is gonna take a while. For the trails, sure. For, for, for the whole site. Right. And then from that, we, we glean out the things based off of what the, what the budget will allow us to do with mm -hmm. 4B money if, if that's uh, possible. In addition to that, uh, grant funding for that is, um, there's opportunities for grant funding for that as well. So I would hope that you would uh, give consideration to that and to trying to move this a little quicker than it has moved. Sure. Yes. Thank you. You are welcome. It's not a motion, but I second it, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, there seems like, you know, if you take the time and effort to come, um, you know, and he's got valid points and um, it seems like there's something that can be done in the interim. Well, and, that, and that's why I invited him here. It's mm -hmm. exactly why. He can see the process, understand the process, see how the board works for the community. Um, so it's a, it's a good thing, for sure. And we appreciate you being here. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. And it's, it's been a decade. Let's see what we can do. Okay, are we moving on to the wildflower presentation? Okay. Look at that. <laughs> Thank y'all for sitting through this with me. We all had, we all had this stuff. Like, well, we like you had a second period. <laughs> well, this is game this is seven. Yours. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so at the last meeting, uh, I was asked to provide an update on the wildflower planting program that we have. So here we go. Um, so we do have a program, and it is documented. All these areas that are in uh, red with yellow, and, and they're real easy to pick out. These are areas that we currently uh, plant wildflowers at, okay? So this is the Highland Village Tennis Center on Highland Village Road. This is City Hall, you see the two areas there, one on the south end and one on the north end. This is uh, Double Tree Ranch in the, in the back. This is Lakeside Park. Mm -hmm. Uh, Lions Club, Murray Park, uh, City Hall front of the building, Victoria Trail, Village Park, Wichita Forest. And these are the seed types. These are considered native and adaptive here. Um, and this is what we purchase uh, every year. Wow. So you guys actually go out and seed all those areas every year? Yes, sir. Wow. Um, so the planning process is uh, an October planning uh, areas are scalped with a mower, 
and blown off and cleaned. And then there's a manual spreading uh, of the seeds. We don't have a sower that mechanically does it. And then there's a soft drag, like what we do with uh, the ryegrass on sports on the dog park. We, we run a cocoa mat or, or a piece of an old carpet over it so that it can have that good um, seed to soil contact that will promote germination. So the environmental conditions that factor in for the success of seed germination are this, the seed to soil contact, extremely important. We think we got that covered pretty good. The number of cold days uh, have an impact on that seed germination. Mm -hmm. uh, a late freeze, if we wind up with a late freeze, or I should have put early freeze on there too, if we wind up with an early freeze, um, it impacts the, the success of the program. The amount of water, um, during the germ germination process. If it's not getting enough water and that first radical drops and it's not wet, it's gonna die. Uh, the accumulation of thatch, that's additional mowing after the scalping. Mm -hmm. And if it, it sits on there and it gets wet, it could rot, the seed could rot. Um, and then birds and other, other animals eating the seeds. Uh, we've, in all those areas, uh, the majority of them do not have irrigation. They're wildflower seeds. You know, the, the whole intent is not, is, is to let them uh, do their thing without any manipulation other than the, the prep of the area and, and dropping the seeds. Um, so in those areas, we have a lot of activity. We have mice, we have field mice, we have rats, we have birds, and they're all looking for that. And that time of the year, um, they're trying to overwinter. So that, um, it does uh, impact the, uh, the seed germination, especially if the seeds aren't there. And we're small but mighty, and I'll take any questions. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't know you guys had a planning program for wildflowers. That's yeah, we, awesome. Yeah, and it's been in place for five years. That's, that's really good. Yeah. I'm glad to see that because um, I just thought it was happening on its own, and I was thinking we could do something like this. No, but it's we're intentional. already doing it, which is fantastic. <laughs> yeah, and it, 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 you know we we could do more, but it's it's labor intensive, and as you can see, those are a lot of areas, and and we do get calls. We get compared to Flower Mound and and in other cities. And um, um, there's a lot of things that influence the success of that program, um, and and uh, too many factors that, that play into that. But we, mm -hmm. we can show you the receipts and the work order uh, labor reports that show that we're doing it. And I would wonder if there's not a potential for a large volunteer event around that time of the year to get people to come out and plant seeds and be involved in helping their community continue to be beautiful in the spring. Or we maybe offer seeds mm -hmm. for them to have their own wildflower, patch of wildflower in their in their own lawns or, mm -hmm. or backyards or things like that. And if that takes off, we could look at potentially doing more areas since we'd have more people who are mm -hmm. being involved and working on it. And we have to be, I have to be mindful of those areas too, especially in sight lines and traffic and where they can go versus where they can't go. And then uh, also areas that folks have been accustomed to not having what in their mind looks like weeds, because there's still an educational process with that. You know, a big one that we get is the one over here by Brazos, the detention pond. When are you guys going to mow that? Of course, there's flowers in it and everything. <laughs> it just looks awful. You know, so we have to educate them. That's a non-mow area for the for the life of the wildflowers that will be growing there. So. Uh, perception is plays into the decision as well, as well as uh, safety with sight lines and traffic and things like that. Nice. Is that little area on Selmire included in that across from Victory uh, or uh, Victoria. Victoria Park? Let's see. That private. Yeah, space. that little where there's there's purple paint on the pillars there. So I figured that was Selmire and what? So Selmire right across from Victoria Park where the power lines are. It's that open plot of land. There's a spot in there too with. Uh, so it'd be oh no, that's uh, that's not ours. That's the Encore easement. Okay, because that's so what we, I figured. We Is don't plan anything there and or maintain that. But there's a, I mean, last year there was a good good mountain there. This year is a little bit different. But yeah, it's about early. More likely the residents that are that are doing that, or it's through the natural process of mm -hmm. just. Because yeah, I, I had noticed this that there was actually purple paint out there. So I'm like, either uh -oh. somebody owns that or something. Yeah. And I was like, I didn't know if y'all go in there and do that too. I was taking a walk one day and I saw the blue bonnets starting to form, yeah. like not the flower, but the plant. Mm -hmm. And then I came by a couple days later, 
they mowed the whole thing down. And I was like, well, yeah, I'm not, not going to get as good of a uh, field yeah. this year, but it is what it is. It yeah. happens. Um, so talking about that easement, I know we have that part across from Victoria that has the flowers along the path underneath the power lines. Is that whole area under the power lines, um, even down the hill across from Highland Village Road, a space that we could think about doing some more wildflower planting on that area alongside the trail as it goes down the hill near the soccer fields? Right, so again, coming back to the available labor hours, the cost okay. of the seeds. So it's a labor deal. It's not like well, the power company. I'm, I'm not we saying can't we do can't it. do it. No, we can we can do it. We okay. we have an agreement with a power company, but we just have to be mindful of what we're pulling away that time of the year we're getting baseball fields ready. We're ending we're we're ending our concert series or right in the middle of the concert series and headed into our winter events. Um, and um, it's a that everything kind of bottlenecks at the end of September through um, the first part of December. Mm -hmm. All right. In addition to that, you know, like I said, baseball and softball are ending. Yeah. Flag football, soccer. Um, but um, you know, if 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 you want to discuss additional areas um, that um, that you would like for us to consider. Uh, we'll, we'll definitely do the math and just come on by the office and let's sit down, have a conversation. Yeah, and then I'll start thinking of outside marketing and potential volunteer opportunities to help out with this. And maybe this year it could be a, we're doing the same spots, but come out with the crew, learn about it a bit, mm -hmm. get your hands on it, and come away with some packets of seeds for your own house. Yep. And then the year after, where if we, if you guys liked the work and you're okay with it, you could have the volunteer group do certain sections on their own. Yep, and we would just need to, uh, us as a department would need to designate all those areas. Hmm. Um, as right now, we have, most of our complaints are just folks that are uneducated about wildflowers. Okay. But once they understand, they're like, okay, I get it now. That's great, that's, that's great to know though. I, I see many outside opportunities for like myself as a citizen to okay. get involved with this and to help out, which is really why I was wanting to ask about it as well. Okay, well, I didn't know there was a seed planting, which yeah. is why I wanted the board involved. But now that you're saying there's a concerted effort and it's more of kind of a labor yeah. issue because you have so much going on, that's where I can kind of step yeah. back as yeah. a citizen and look at it. The volunteer uh, thing is a great option, even to church, if churches want to get involved, uh, things like that. We work with them, and, and you'll find out that we do very little winging. Yeah. Yeah, we we have a pl we plan plan. That's what we are in parks and recreation. You know, we we can plan the heck out of anything. So we, and we we really want to know the impact. We want to know what the cost is. We want to know the labor hours. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's very important to us. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate you getting this together. For sure. Um, You're very welcome. Can we have this emailed to us as well? Yes, absolutely. Because I'd like to just have those little areas mapped out so I can re uh, reference them in the future. Okay. Any other questions on this? Okay. Thanks, Phil. You are welcome. So I guess that brings us down to corps of, uh, the Corps of Engineers update. Uh, there has been no movement uh, from the Corps of Engineers as far as posting uh, anything. Um, so we, we looked at it, me and Terry looked at it at, uh, last week. So no update. Uh, we do have a signed contract, a signed agreement. Yep. It's so, a big win. Yeah, that is a big win. And uh, anything on boat docks or anything? No, not yet. Other, other. Well, that that that's not true. We we had a meeting with Core two weeks ago. Uh, me and an architect on another project. And they they did tell us just like I told you that they plan on enforcing uh, this spring. They just couldn't give us a a date. So that that came directly from uh, Corp staff when we were visiting with them. Okay. Any other comments on that? Um, NRPA update. So NRPA is National Recreation and Park Association, and I've been lucky to be on the uh, on the uh, program committee. So I'm I'm part of the team that is bringing that to Dallas. And um, we're very excited about it. This doesn't happen that often. And um, this opportunity for the board uh, to come 
uh, and to see what it looks like at a national level. Um, and if you're wanting to attend some sessions uh, to see what they're like, and just to list off some of the sessions that are there, um, of course, there's the exhibit hall that is just, it's, it's phenomenal. It'll be at the K. Bailey Hutchinson Center. Um, but there's aquatics, you know, and that even deals with splash pads. Uh, M&O, um, which is an area that uh, I am providing expertise in for other cities around the, around the nation. One of them is Mobile, Alabama, working with them. Um, the conservation. Uh, customer service, leadership, that's another one that I have that's on the, that uh, I have the ability or uh, the opportunity to help other cities with. Uh, health and wellness, uh, planning and design, diversity and inclusion, special events, marketing, recreation, programming. Um, so there's, there's, uh, th this is everything having to do with parks and recreation. Um, and those are just a few, that's not even all of them. So what I would like for you to do, because it's, it's open right now, and I've talked with Ken about this and, and also the city manager, but if you're interested, the dates are, are October the 10th through the 12th, okay? Is there a website? We can yeah, nrpa.org, um, take a look at that. And, and I can also send it to you tomorrow, the link. But um, if you're interested, please let me know, or let m both me and Terry know, so that we can start, because uh, we're in the budget cycle, go ahead and, and capture those funds for you guys to attend, okay? Well, how much is a normal entry fee? Is it open to public, or you have to be? Oh, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's open to park board and, and city council and mayors. Okay. Yeah, and, and you, you, we see them all the time at the national. Um, so, so, yeah, definitely, it's open up to you guys. Awesome. So uh, the price ranges from a full package, mm, which I wouldn't think that you would want, um, but I could be wrong, um, around the, I, I can't even remember what that cost is. Okay, I'll send you the information. I know I know a day, a day just to go to the um, exhibit hall is like 40 bucks. Okay. Um, but the, each, if, if you pay for the whole package, you're paying for educational session opportunities as well, and and they have blocks A, B, and C, and you just choose what you want, and you and you go to them. Okay. So, but uh, park board members, city council, mayors, uh, uh, frequently, especially the host city, um, they they get a lot of the uh, the local uh, city government that winds up going. That's cool. Yeah, that's very cool. Uh, where's it going to be hosted in Dallas? Uh, the K Bailey Hutchinson Center. Okay. Nice. Yep. That's a nice place. And we could even, you know, if, if you all wanted to just to pick a day and, you know, and I can run that through email if, if once I sent you the, once I send you the information and you just respond to me directly, I say, okay, everyone's looking like they want to go on Tuesday. All right, so we, we can get one of our bus drivers to take us down there, drop us off and uh, come back and pick us up. Do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just kind of go by email. Mm -hmm. Yep. We could take DCTA to Carrollton and all that. <laughs> you can Get take out of DCTA. Yep, you that's can do true. that as well, for sure. I yep. used to have an office right there at the K. Bailey Hutchinson, and somebody asked me, well, would you take this or would you take that? Well, I'd take a train if it was up here and would take me all the way down. And now it does, but I don't work anymore, so. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> Not working anymore. So I'll send you that information, and then if you could, you know, just kind of let me know by next week, and we'll go back and forth with email, just respond to me directly one at a time, instead of the whole group. Sounds great. Uh, me and Terry, actually, and we'll, we'll keep a list going. <coughs> and you said October 10th? October 10th through the 12th. Okay, perfect. Yeah, and when you get that information, you'll see, uh, you'll see some of the activities that are on there, but not all of them. Awesome. Any, any more questions on that? No? I'm good, okay. thanks. All right, number nine, discussion of uh, discussion on future agenda items. A board, a board member may inquire about a subject of which notice has not been given, a statement of fact, or specific factual information or recitation of uh, existing policy may be given. Any deliberation shall be limited to a proposal to place the subject on an agenda for a subsequent meeting. <laughs> Anybody have any comments on that? I did have kind of one that I wanted to 
kind of mention about a little bit, and I know Phil, we talked about this over the phone, um, but kind of talking about the whole Kids Castle Park kind of changing around a little bit, and you know, security concerns, you know, up there at Unity, and you know, I think this is a perfect fit for this when we're talking about this with Kids Castle um, in general too, is just to kind of kind of go over a plan um, that we can do to. You know, whether it's, a, you know, I know we mentioned this on the phone, but just putting it out there, but in terms of security, you know, for folks that, that go there. And I know we said about, you know, don't don't be a victim and, and everything, but, you know, and it was during the middle of the day that this did happen, um, that somebody's car got broken into, but I feel like um, security of our parks is extremely important. I know we do a phenomenal job, phenomenal, but trying to limit that in the future, um, trying to come up with a plan. Um, doesn't have to be big, just, you know, one sign that says you're being recorded. You know, something along those lines that I think, because it just kind of gnawed at me a little bit, and I just thought it would be something our residents would really like to. Um, you know, I know you don't want to be a victim. You don't want to be a victim, nobody does. But if we could try to deter that in some sort of way in terms of security of our parks and putting the right cameras in the right places and what they do, what, what they capture, um, you know, I think would be something very beneficial, you know, for us to discuss about. Okay. We, we will, um, I'll get police looped in on this and we'll present something. But I will tell you one thing. Um, this past year, our parks, I teamed up our park supervisor, I got with Doug, and he teamed up a police officer, and they went to every park site and used uh, SEPTED principles, crime prevention through environmental design, and evaluated every single park through the lens of a police officer, and we are making those adjustments right now, so I'm happy okay. to say that. But we will uh, we'll bring a, a formal update, and I'll, I'll invite police to come in and talk about that. Okay. And it's not like a big change of anything. I think it's just gonna be helpful for us to know what is in place really, you know, more informative type thing of what, what do those cameras do, you know, for everybody here, you know, what do they do, what do they capture, um, you know, and how going forward we start preventing, you know, a little bit more of that. And I know we do a phenomenal job, phenomenal job. And I'm not saying that to anybody not doing the job or anything like that. I just, uh, you know, when you see that, you just kind of want to address it a little bit, um, making sure that everybody has every opportunity. I understand. We'll bring that information to you in the next meeting. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? No? Good job. All right, so our next scheduled meeting will be for June 19th of 2023, and I will adjourn this meeting at 737.